a remark you'll sometimes see nowadays that Disney movies are too political now. And to be honest, this always makes me roll my eyes. Because like a lot of movies, the political views of the filmmakers have always found their way into the films produced by Disney. So this is not a recent phenomenon. You might say that Disney was more subtle back then. However, while Disney films are many things, subtle is not one of them. Focusing specifically on the animated films, political themes have been ingrained in them since the days of Walt Disney. A great example of this is with Dumbo, which has a clear theme on discrimination. The lead protagonist, Dumbo, is marginalized, even among other elephants, simply for being different. Among the few characters who support him and sympathize with him are a group of crows, most of whom are voiced by African Americans. Even though there are certainly aspects of Dumbo that have not aged well, the film is otherwise making a statement about how society looks down on and poorly treats those seen as different. This is not the only political theme in Dumbo, which was made during the Disney animator strike of 1941. There's a scene where a bunch of drunken clowns announce they're going to try and get a raise from the circus ringmaster. Let's go tell the boss! Yeah, sure, yeah, come yeah, on, let's yeah. hit it. Hey, hey, let's hit him for a raise. Yeah, sure, this is white real dog. Now, which famously anti-union producer do you think approved that line? As much as people have this image of Walt Disney as a figure who made sweet and innocent family pictures, his political stances nonetheless showed up in the movies he produced. One of Walt Disney's personality traits was his affection for animals and wildlife. He had a genuine love for the animal kingdom, and that's why so many of his films sought to make them endearing to the audience. A Disney movie that particularly highlighted this was Bambi. The film portrays the animal habitat as mostly peaceful until humans come into the woods with their guns shooting everything in their path. There's a clear anti-hunting message, and actual hunters did not take kindly to this depiction of them, accusing Bambi of being false propaganda. Interesting enough, Disney immediately allowed use of the characters from Bambi in public service announcements produced by the United States Forest Service. After this partnership ended, Smokey Bear was created to serve as their official mascot. One of my personal favorite Disney characters was created for primarily political reasons. That was José Carioca, who debuted in the film Solo dos Amigos. As part of Franklin Roosevelt's good neighbor policy to strengthen ties with Latin America during World War II, he asked Walt Disney to go down there, knowing his characters were popular in those countries. He brought some artists along with him, and the trip inspired Solo dos Amigos and the Three Caballeros. Without the support of the American government and this idea, José Carioca probably would not exist. Of course, a core element of several Disney animated films is that the good character triumphing over those who wish to do harm to others. That is an inherently political concept, no matter what stance you have. In Snow White, for instance, the film rejects the Queen's cold ruling of the kingdom in favor of Snow White's kindness towards animals and other beings like the dwarves. The Sword in the Stone implies that Arthur became a great king later in life because of Merlin's scientific and forward-thinking teachings rather than the overly masculine, brute ideologies of his family and the trickery of Madame Mim. An interesting aspect of Walt Disney's personality is that while he was very much in support of innovation and technical advancements to help humankind achieve greater feats, there was a nostalgic aspect of the films produced under his watch. For example, the setting of Lady and the Tramp was inspired by the town of Marceline, Missouri, where he spent a couple of years as a child. He wanted people to move forward in several ways, but also longed for certain aspects of his childhood years. Even after Walt Disney died, the political subtext of the animated films remained. Robin Hood is an obviously political work in more ways than one. After all, it's about an outlaw who steals from the wealthy and the royalty and gives that money to the poor being heavily taxed. In this version of the legend, Prince John is portrayed as a whiny, temperamental figure who resorts to sucking his thumb when he doesn't get his way. And then you have the song, The Phony King of England, which borrows its melody and some lyrics from a satirical song about the sexual exploits of kings and queens. In Robin Hood, it's changed into a tune that openly mocks Prince John and calls him out for being a false king. There's a reason the phony King of England is often used as an anthem against political figures whose policies only seek to harm the public. A period that certain viewers often point to as a time when Disney was not political was the animation renaissance of the late 80s and 90s, which is funny considering the kinds of films being made and the people who worked on them. A perfect example is with Beauty and the Beast. That was one of the last films worked on by Howard Ashman, who put a lot of his own fears into the songs and story. He was a gay man who was dying of AIDS during the production of that film, and his feelings about the rampant homophobia and the response to the AIDS epidemic is evident in the mob song in particular. The entire song has Gaston fear-mongering the village into joining him to kill the beast. Gaston rallies them by portraying him as this vicious monster and getting them into a frenzy. It's no coincidence that at one point the villagers sing that we don't like what we don't understand, in fact it scares us, and this monster is mysterious at least. 
Ashman also related a lot to the Beast, a cursed being who sits in his home angry at what has happened to him, and was instrumental in him being given more screen time in later drafts. Probably the most popular film of the Disney Renaissance is certainly one of its most political, and that's The Lion King. That movie told the story of a king's brother who decides to take control of the throne by killing him. Under his regime, the land becomes desolate, and it takes his nephew coming back, defeating him, and taking his place as the rightful king to restore the kingdom to its previous state. That is the basic premise of the film, without even going into the deeper subtext, and yet the political themes are still clear. It's very much a story about how the wrong leader can destroy something that was once prosperous, and the necessity of having the right person in charge. The way Scar is portrayed also highlights the political views of the filmmakers. When Jorgen Klubian started storyboarding the Be Prepared sequence, he could not help but notice similarities between Scar and Hitler, with his thirst for power and convincing the hyenas that by overthrowing Mufasa, he will be a better leader for the Pride Lands. So he looked at the famous Nazi propaganda film The Triumph of the Will as a visual inspiration, and that's why you have Scar watching the hyenas from above and the hyenas goose-stepping, just to make Scar look that much more threatening. The Lion King is not the only Disney animated film to draw from horrific historical events to shape its villain. The Hunchback of Notre Dame did the same thing when developing the character Frollo. Now in Victor Hugo's original book, Frollo was an archdeacon. However, Disney executives requested that he be changed for the movie out of concern for offending religious sensibilities. They instead made him the Minister of Justice, which wound up making the story even more political. Frollo's evil plan involves wanting to get rid of the Romani people in Paris out of his own hatred and prejudice towards them, and to make sure they made him as realistic as possible, the filmmakers researched historical genocides. And much like Scar was partly based on Hitler, they looked at Ray Fine's portrayal of the ruthless Nazi Amon Goeth in Schindler's List to help write the character of Frollo. What's particularly interesting is the way Hunchback resonated with French viewers. About a year before the film's release, police officers broke down the doors of a church in Paris to capture immigrants who were hiding in there. That was a national story, and French moviegoers were immediately reminded of it when watching the film. A local newspaper also compared Frollo to the leader of the National Front political party, who had received a lot of attention for his anti-immigration views. It's an example of how the political themes in Disney films can resonate with many, even if others might not pick up on them. Another Disney movie that has resonated with a particular group of people is Lilo and Stitch. The film is very popular in Hawaii for respecting the Hawaiian culture and for its depiction of two indigenous Hawaiians who deal with child services. There's also a scene where Nani sings Aloha Oi, a song of a lot of emotional and political resonance to Hawaii. Meanwhile, a scene that was deleted from the movie depicted tourists treating Lilo in a condescending way, including one who assumes Lilo does not speak English. In addition to mocking the sorts of people who treat Hawaii as just some tropical vacation spot, this scene also explains why Lilo photographs tourists. It's not just a funny quirk. It's her thinking, well, if they think I'm a sideshow attraction, I'll treat them the same way. I focus on the films produced by Walt Disney Animation Studios, but Pixar has also tackled political themes in their work. A Bug's Life is about how the grasshoppers exploit the ants to do their bidding using fear and other tactics, and in one pivotal scene, Hopper explains that they cannot let the ants find out they're stronger or more powerful than the grasshoppers when united. Monsters, Inc. is about how corporations are not above choosing unethical practices if it means it will help their profits. The Incredibles films might be the studio's most political, with them depicting an entire group of people forced into hiding when they are deemed dangerous to the public. And need I mention WALL-E, which shows the environmental destruction of Earth caused by bad corporate decisions, and how the discovery of a plant is what starts to set things right again. Over the past number of years, Disney Animation has continued to tackle more political themes. The Princess and the Frog shows how the racism in the 1920s affects Tiana's dreams of starting her own restaurant. Tiana's drive to work even harder to achieve that dream likely stems from how those in power look down on her because she's black. Meanwhile, Zootopia tackled how racial stereotypes have passed down, Frozen 2 explored learning and not making the same mistakes as your ancestors, and Ryan the Last Dragon was about the stupidity of neighboring nations fighting each other. Some people have taken Disney to task for addressing these sorts of political themes in their work and feeling they are alienating audiences, but this is not the first time these accusations have been thrown at the studio. I found a Los Angeles Times article from 1997 that tried to figure out why Hercules did less than many of the Disney animated films that preceded it. At one point in the article, former Time Magazine film critic Richard Schickel says, People are reacting not against Disney, but to changes in the movies it makes. Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast were jaunty, unpretentious light on their feet. Pocahontas, Hercules, and Hunchback are weightier tales. However, the next two Disney movies, Mulan and Tarzan, ended up outgrossing Hercules, and I'll consider them weightier in their tone and themes than Hercules. Mulan was even a war movie that addressed gender roles, so no, I don't think audiences are opposed to political themes in Disney films. 
Zootopia was very overt in its political messaging, and that movie made over a billion dollars. However, Zootopia really lucked out that it opened before you had this industry of YouTubers who post attention-grabbing thumbnails about how Disney is political now, or their favorite new buzzword, woke. It should be mentioned the term woke was coined by African Americans, describing aware of social injustices. It's just unfortunately been twisted around in the past few years. Meanwhile, last year, Disney Animation's Strange World and Pixar's Lightyear got flack from certain people for including gay characters. Gay people just existing and living their lives, which is all those films showed, should not be considered a political issue, and Disney should not be raked over the coals for including them in their films. They even act the same way heterosexual couples have for years in their productions. To conclude, I'm going to politely disagree with anyone who says Disney films have only just become political. Those themes have always been there, as a filmmaker's viewpoint and ideologies will often make their way into their art, even something as simple as a prince and a princess falling in love. It does not matter if you're making All the President's Men or 101 Nominations. All movies are political in some way. See you next time.